disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following hour programming contains forward and backward looking statements that may or may not reflect actual scientific truth, but are performative acts of thinking around scientific subjects. Listeners are asked to suspend all belief and take everything they hear as though it is being offered up for debate. For example, you're likely to hear absolute statements about the dangers of too much energy conservation. If you disagree, you are encouraged to do so. In fact, the more skeptical you are about anything you hear, the more likely you are to question it. The more you question, the more answers you will get in return. If you are sufficiently skeptical about the answers you get in return, the better your next round of questions will be refined. The more refined your questions are, the more detailed the answers will become. The more detailed your questions are, the more complicated the answers will necessarily be. As this complexity grows, so will your understanding until one day you will look back at a lifetime of conversations and say, I get it. Some of it anyway. The rest is still ahead on This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Kirsten? <laughs> yeah, same to you, Justin. Welcome, everybody. This is This Week in Science, and we're here to talk all about the science. There's so much, as usual. So much stuff. You've had a good week so far. We made you get up early, right, Justin? Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll do it again next week. <laughs> no, I got it. Oh, geez. <laughs> we'll just keep it coming. Early mornings for Justin Jackson. That's right. Anyway, today, the science news I brought involves Neanderthals, brains, and some parasites. What did you bring? I have, I've got robots that are being built too well. Uh, I've got, uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, uh, something that animals may be disturbing uh, archaeology. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Digging up the I bones, know. chewing on them. Worse. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you, I mean, the story is just they're knocking them, they're trampling them. Ooh. Down like a couple feet or a foot, eight inches, six inches. So that uh, changes when we go back and are looking at like primitive man. It could, you know, change dates of uh, settling areas by thousands of years. And I've got actually my top story is pretty quick, but it's going to be the danger of energy conservation. Oh, you are big on the danger of energy conservation. That's uh, been some, that's a topic of yours. World, you know. And I got huh. a bunch of other stuff. This is all. This is, I wrote a book, well, I didn't write a book. I printed out <laughs> a bunch of paper of other people's writings, and I'm calling it mine. Right, it's yours, it's yours. Well, for now, it's all ours, because we're sharing it with you. So the story I want to head off the top of the hour with has to do with parasites. We all love parasites, <laughs> especially the malaria parasite. I know, you thought I was going to say toxoplasma, didn't you? Didn't you? But I didn't. Just because my cat is hanging out here, I'm letting I'm letting her have it, have it easy this evening, and we are going to talk about malaria instead. And we're going to blame it on gorillas. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> so there's a question of when exactly, or where exactly, the malaria parasite um, actually started infecting humans has it always had a, had a penchant for infecting humans does it infect other animals a researcher at the university of alabama in birmingham beatrice hahn and a bunch of her colleagues had a bunch of chimp and bonobo and gorilla droppings in their freezer and they had cataloged it all and you know what they were in what they were interested in primarily was investigating uh, genetic material from uh, HIV for their AIDS studies. 
but they also looked at, for DNA from malaria parasites. And so the main malaria parasite is the Plasmodium falciparum parasite. And that's the one that uh, we're familiar with infecting humans. So Plasmodium falciparum uh, the DNA for that parasite, they, when they looked in all the, the different droppings, they ended up finding that the genetic material in the droppings for gorillas was actually the most similar to that of humans versus the uh, chimps and the bonobos. So even though chimps are more closely related to us, um, the gorillas are actually the ones who probably first, uh, where, the, where the parasite probably first made the jump uh, to, to infecting humans. However, researchers, you know, they don't know exactly how it happened, where it would have happened. There are multiple different species um, of, of this plasmodium parasite, uh, and in Africa, there is native resistance to P Plasmodium vivax. It's very high, but uh, falciparum causes the ma majority of the deaths. So vivax parasites, according to a blog, johnhawks.net, uh, seem to have been around for at least tens of thousands of years versus falciparum being relatively younger. And so the falciparum could have a swept over um, you know, more recently. And it could have been as a result of biting a gorilla and then biting a human, or it could have uh, the same a mosquito biting a gorilla and biting a human, or because we know that there is uh, the bushmeat trade, this meat trade and uh, that's been going on for years and years, that it could have come over in uh, the harvesting of meat at some point in history. So we don't yeah, know that's, exactly I mean, that's how it happened. Where we got the, that's likely where the avian flu came from, SARS. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of that. It's uh, wildlife driven that, that jumps into the human sphere through us eating stuff and then uh, freaks out and goes global and pandemic -y on us. Yeah. So uh, John Hawks on his blog, he says that uh, falciparum history seems to indicate that its present widespread distribution is very recent phenomenon, probably only within the last 5,000 years or so. Because P. falciparum is phenotypically similar to the major chimpanzee malaria parasite, uh, P. reichenaui, most scientists have assumed that we got falciparum malaria from chimpanzees, but this report uh, where researchers publish, let's see, where did they publish in Nature magazine, uh, they've surveyed parasite variation, gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees, and it's all a very small group of gorilla parasites. That's it. Just the It's the gorilla's fault. Maybe ours, too, but or maybe it's the mosquito's fault. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We can't blame it on anyone yet, unfortunately. But I think it's a really in, the the implications for this. I think are where we uh, where we start uh, thinking about eradicating malaria and how are we going to get rid of it. Um, you know, we're not necessarily or we, we haven't been concerned about primates and malaria um, I mean, or infections. Been, yeah. I've been concerned about primates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. malaria-infected primates. Mostly the human ones. They're exactly. everywhere, Kirsten. Haven't you noticed? They're everywhere. Yeah. So if we try and get rid of malaria in humans and we eradicate it in humans, but it still exists in a little little group of gorillas, the possibility that it could come back at any point in time is still there. So we Kill have to... all the gorillas? Yeah, so yeah. Them. Like That's exactly it. Maybe <laughs> stop eating them. Uh, Do you really need to eat gorillas at this point anyway? I, no, that, I mean, that's the whole thing. Don't eat any more gorillas. And maybe we can come up with, I mean, I like, I personally think the malaria treat, uh, the malaria attempts to control malaria that don't involve, involve treating people necessarily with antibodies or anything that more that more could be done with actually trying to affect the parasites themselves the uh the mosquitoes that carry them the parasites themselves um and 
because uh, then you get just get rid of I don't know find a way to get rid of the parasites I don't know I don't know it, it, it's very hard <sighs> yeah gorilla parasite shadow tiger in the uh, in the chat room says these gorilla parasites are hard to defeat yeah wrong kind of gorilla <laughs> What you got? You know, I'm going to uh, switch real quick and go to this. This this is a story that has me very conflicted. Conflicted? Yes. It's two, two of my rants, that uh, two things I've ranted against and about that are now going head to head. <laughs> okay. Very troubling. Uh, so the antibacterial ingredient in a lot of soaps, toothpastes, Hairbrushes, every, it's like in everything now. The tri, uh, what is it? The tri, uh, triclosan. Triclosan, yeah. Yeah. So I've been ranting against using these antibacterial soaps because, a large in large uh, respect, our use of these antibacterial soaps and materials uh, may actually be helping engineer a future superbug. Kills off all the weak stuff. All the super resistant, strong ones survive. And over generations, they become all super resistant, and then we can't we can't fight them off. So, Ben, and also there's a, there's a chance that the tri triclosan, um, when mixed with chlorine, can actually create a carcinogen, which you know because we chlorinate so much of the water using these antibacterial soaps could actually be dangerous for us in some small respect. And now, now there's a report here that's saying that. Uh, the, the triclosan has a powerful effect in blocking the action that is a key enzyme that is required for T. gondii to live. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> no, I have, now I have to choose parasite versus the superbug. Oh, no. this, is, this is frustrating. Life is full of choices, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's just the, this is other than that, this story just has the general rundown of T. gondii that it affects about a third of the world's population, about 80% of the population in Brazil. Uh, people can catch the infection spread by uh, the parasite Toxoplasma gondii by having uh, contact with uh, feces from infected cats or, you know, the spread of those parasites around a house where a cat um, lives. Spread of the, you know, it's uh, eating raw, undercooked meats that it could have been taken up by the animals, and in other ways. But yeah, many people have those symptoms because their immune systems keep the infection under control, while the parasite remains inactive. But it can cause eye damage and blindness, especially in babies, because of the mother's exposure to cats. And the is this is this where I'm just supposed to smile prettily after I was just hanging out with my cat? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, well, I'm just gonna, you know, point to your child. It's like all your problems, you can you can blame on your your mother keeping a cat longer than she should have. She chose the cat <laughs> over you. But this is just guilt. You shouldn't. I you shouldn't listen to any of this. So anyway, yeah. Now it's uh, they they can't they can't medicalize this because you can't take um, the molecule of tri triclosan doesn't break down in the body properly and may have negative effects or even so it's like not supposed to. It doesn't dissolve in the blood. It wouldn't affect the parasite. It wouldn't get through the blood brain barrier. So it can't be used as a medication yet, but they're studying the triclosan to see if they can come up with uh, some way of uh, coming up with a way to, to, to fend off Toxoplasma gondii. Wow, having to choose between those two evils. That's mm. brutal. Yeah, I don't know. I, wonder, I, I, I could just temporarily stock up on triclosan anti- antibacterial soaps oh, absolutely. and, um, you know, fight, fight Toxo at the same time. There we go. Yeah. They're all over your countertops. Bathe in it. <laughs> Everywhere. You have cats. Wherever your cat goes, that's put, what you're going to have. Put to, it like, on my cat. Right. Yeah, well, that's a good, that's a good place to start. <laughs> Bathe my cat in triclosan. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Hey, did a Russian uh, cure aging? Do you know? Yes. No, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm going to guess no. Well, it's that's what people are wondering. Yes, no, we don't know. Did he? Did he not? 
Uh, turns out there's a really interesting uh, report that um, I found this morning on the Singularity Hub but was also sent to me by David Eckerd uh, about this guy, researcher, Russian researcher, Vladimir Skulaychev. And he's a well-respected researcher. He has lots of uh, published research that is very well cited within other within the scientific literature so that means that he's doing good science other people uh trust what he's saying and uh and are using and citing what's he, what he's saying so he's he's not a crackpot all right yet there's a report out that he has um come up with a treatment that could be put into a pill form they're trying to test it in humans now uh currently uh, this this treatment could potentially potentially if if given to people not let people live longer or cure aging so to speak the media has been kind of calling it curing aging but what it would do is make it so that more people would live to say a hundred so not a few people living to 120 but more of the general public actually making it to live to a hundred and um and maybe being healthier during that period of time as well i don't know it's 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 a really interesting claim and that's the claim that he's made uh he came up with this term called the programmed aging theory that um and he's also he's got he's he's at a university in this this product he's coming out with he hasn't said exactly what it's composed of or what it does he's done several animal studies uh treating glaucoma of the eyes uh and then he, it worked so well on animals that he put the did use the treatment on himself and he says he cured his glaucoma using this treatment um what people think that it's based on is a, a derivative, a derivative, this is from this uh, Singularity Hub article, a derivative of an earlier antioxidant substance that he's been working on called SKQ1. And so in, in work that Skalachev had done, he showed that SKQ1 could actually penetrate into the mitochondria. And that's... Um, an issue with most antioxidants which have a hard time getting into the mitochondria to actually stop uh, oxidation damage that could be taking place in those powerhouse cells that are so important to our cellular um, metabolism. So he's shown in fungus, crustaceans, insects, and mice that SKQ1 can extend the lives of all of these animals. And uh, the median lifespan, again, that these animals, uh, the median lifespan was extended by 100%. So the average mouse life was, the average mouse life was twice as long. Uh, and, wow. and yeah. So they don't know yet, you know, if the so same. That could be like, that could put humans out to like 100 and. 160 even 180 good right yeah, the or, centurions could live to 200 well no the what's the average what's the what's the average, the average is like 72 life. is it like 72 okay so it would be if guys, it were, women it's almost 80 i think mm. yeah so anyway we're looking up we'd be looking at between 140 and 160 years possibly oh you know <laughs> well not only there goes your inheritance but yeah uh, <laughs> all used up <laughs> Yeah, the other, the other part of it, I wouldn't mind if it kept you young longer. I mean, right, and I'm that's the thing. It, it doesn't keep you stay young longer, you know? But, yeah. but, you know, something that is going to keep you old longer doesn't sound as appealing until you're old, at which point I'm sure that sounds freaking awesome. <laughs> but if you're going to be, but what they're saying is that, you know, if you're living to 100, that you would be healthier getting up to that 100 so you would pay, maybe you know feel young you wouldn't be decrepit at you know excuse me at 80 and right. then and then live until you're 160 you know that's not what would happen you would actually have you know good health the majority of, of, of your life 
That would rock. Although I believe, uh, I believe we would find at some point that the aesthetic of of what we currently consider beauty uh, mm. would change. Oh, it uh, has to. I think, I think you would find like a lot of a lot of gene uh, uh, commercials. Well, you know, <laughs> plastic surgery. With, <laughs> a lot of the, plastic, plastic surgery. surgery. No, I think I think what would actually happen is that the aesthetic would have to change, and you would see like lots of gene commercials with eighty year olds. Right, yeah. you know, arm around each other, hand in the back pocket. I think that aesthetic of of what the you know what the hip age, what the beauty age, what the mid range age. I think that would all change. I think it would change every dynamic about like all all the TV shows. Instead of these people in their twenties to forties and fifties, it would be, everybody be like eighty, ninety years old on every television show that you tuned into. <laughs> probably, it, it probably would. That's because they're going to appeal to who's mostly out there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Instead of having the baby boomer TV shows on all the time or the Y generation X, whatever the generation, you know, marketing uh, subcategories are, the the main category would soon become, you know, centurions. And every show yeah. would be like, you know, a centurion oriented show. Yeah, there would be a lot like, that would have to change that, you know, it would completely change, you know, um, yeah. so many social programs. It would change how long people work. It would change you know, dating, um, it would, it would change so much stuff, which is exciting and interesting, but it would be, you know, just would affect society really, really dramatically. Um, the one last thing I just wanted to say about it, I just wanted to say one last, one last thing about it is that it is currently in human trials for, as a glaucoma treatment. Um, but they're, they're not testing it currently for this kind of, anti-aging cure for aging kind of uh uh ability and and you can't really do the life extension kind of test is, except just to make sure that it's safe and that it's not hurting people so if it doesn't have any side effects it doesn't hurt people then you can possibly say that it maybe has life extension properties but you don't really know because how are you going to test it except on mice who live much shorter lives or just use it for the next 20 years and see what happens we need more of that in research we need more like yeah. see what happens you know yeah, have people volunteer happens. they volunteer they signed a waiver if it kills them ugh. you know if they survive to live to 200 hey yay maybe but uh the thing i was going to say that, that it, how would it alter our society greatly we have in the last thousand years or so doubled pretty much doubled the age in which that people can live to right uh, you know we we look at uh, one of the things like teeth teeth you know you lose one generation of teeth you get the new teeth like the you know my son losing his his tooth he's going to get new teeth we That's don't get so another barbaric. round of new teeth because we never lived that long uh, yeah. historically and if you also look at people quite often in this day and age will have children in their 30s Whereas the typical age of birth back in the, you know, thousand years ago would have been under 20. If you made it to 20, you were over the hill and probably probably too late to have kids, they would consider. <laughs> because you weren't married, you know. But, but people were married at 12, 13, 14, which seems insanely young to us today. And it really is. And, you know, maybe, maybe you know, 50 years or 100 years from now, people are like, wow, you got married at 70? Whew. <laughs> Hope you knew what you were doing, because yeah, you got to quit to commit right there. Right. So even though it would change, it will. The change once it takes place will seem natural, logical, and and anything that came before will seem like barbaric practices of the past. Right. You mean people right. got together when they still had their 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 last their their uh their shiny non wrinkled skin? Ew. Right. Yeah, gross. Right. Or or maybe you have uh you I know multiple life stages. Even know how somebody's stages. gonna look before they wrinkle. <laughs> right. You, or you have multiple life stages where you have, you know, your young life where you, you know, have one one partner, set of partners or whatever. And then you have your old life. You, you marry another time and you have children in one life. You work on other things in your late life. You know, they're just, just going to force different. us all to work when we're young. That's what it's <laughs> going to be. You're going to have to work till you're 100 and then you'll get to retire. Yeah, to the mines. Years. What's the next story? This is the. Uh, this comes from the Office of Naval Research Global, ONR Global, that continues to ignore the advice of me, 
and pursue aggressive energy goals established by the Secretary of Navy, Ray Mabus. With the design of a system that controls electrical flow for lighting, a highly efficient platform that may spark a new era of power savings. This was designed in the, uh, by the Tokyo Institute of Technology and has been fine-tuned by researchers at Merce Tech. And what basically it is, is they, uh, they found a way to regulate the flow of electricity so that it's using 40% Oh, here it goes. It's a, it's a goal is to ensure that at least 40% of the Navy's total energy com uh, consumption comes from alternative sources by 2020. This is brutal. It's reducing uh, peak. It's creating peak power savings of 39% per device. And this device is not only conserves electricity, but produces less heat, produces less electromagnetic interference than conventional technologies. <sighs> This is going to accelerate the decline of our society. Apparently, lighting today accounts for nearly 20% of the average home's electricity use. Yeah. Really, really, we should be pushing it up. We should be trying for more like 40, 50%. We should not be turning the lights off, people. Justin, I don't, why? It's not, okay. I know you've explained before, but please, for, for everyone in the audience who doesn't understand your logic here, please explain your logic. Okay. Basically, it works like this. If everybody in the United States tomorrow is driving a hybrid vehicle that doesn't require oil, uh, you know, fuel cell, something like that, it will not reduce the global consumption of oil. What it will do is make oil so drastically cheapened that more and more industrialized nations will be able to use it. They will use it less efficiently, less cleanly, and the more that gets used, the more industries will be created that will then generate a new round of energy needs. It's a growth, 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 growth prospect. The less energy we use as a society, especially the United States, we have a great responsibility to use as much energy as possible. If you look historically, uh, they had, there was a study, oh, the book, what was it called? I think it was called The Story of Coal. It was written around 1865. And basically what had happened at the time is there was a huge breakthrough in the efficiency of the steam engine that was being used on trains. And trains running back and forth across the United States were the number one consumer of coal. They became so efficient that the, the, the price of coal plummeted. It became very, very low. Suddenly, though, what happened was it, it wasn't that the coal didn't sell. It's that the coal sold even more because people who would use it maybe a lump or two a week to heat the home now could afford to heat the home every cold night. Uh, industries that wanted to run machinery on coal, who could only use a little bit and wasn't really that uh, cost effective, suddenly could use as much coal as they wanted to burn in their factories. Now, these factories grew, they created products, they created jobs, they created more demand for these products. And what happened then is you have a huge growth in industry. Huge growth in industry means more demand for coal. This is what I think happened with in the last 20 years. If we kept making those uh, poor gas mileage cars that the United States was famous for. If, if it wasn't for us getting more and more efficient with, the, with our vehicles, you know, oil consumption, it never would have opened up, I think, uh, the market for oil in China. It would have been too cost prohibitive. Now, most of the, a lot of the energy being used over there is actually still being technically used by U.S. corporations. But the price became so low that Anybody and everybody could get in and use this energy, and it created manufacturing, and it created all these things that are actually increasing their demand uh, for energy and oil. So basically, right. what, we, what we do when we conserve isn't a solution. It's actually contributing to the problem further down the road. It's creating those, those scenarios where the next generation will need to use even more energy. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I know I know there are people who have written written studies that um, are you know right along the lines of what you're saying. However, there are actual studies showing that you know cities that are using less energy are are really using less energy. That um, you know government regulations are leading to um, less energy use, uh, higher efficiency in industries. So there's you know, there is precedent for reducing our consumption and not having it actually lead to um, even more 
use of the of, of these fuels um but, you know i think i think i think what like, you're saying is right from the coal from from the coal standpoint sure but at the same time there are there have been changes in the western society i mean maybe where where this is going to be a problem is with developing nations those but nations still are us. still developing that's no still no no i don't still think us, so without the regulations on on, on uh, emissions the, those those huge all those manufacturing jobs that used to be in the United States that had all the regulations, um, they didn't just go away. They moved. <laughs> they moved to a place that didn't have regulations, had really cheap labor. So all these, you know, when you, the UK or the United States claim that we've made this so much progress in reducing emissions, we haven't. We just moved the emissions to somewhere where we can actually make more emissions and don't have to be accountable for it. Those factories in China are largely u.s factories manufacturing goods to be sent back to the united states yeah, it's, it's well, a shell game there. yeah and, well, and we, one of the we need... oil is, if oil is more expensive there's less trucking it's it actually limits growth economic growth that's true if it's very expensive and if you that's limit true. economic growth you have less growth in general and that's right. that growth is what makes the demands on the energy system right but if there's a if, what we what we can hope is that there's some kind of a balance where you know oil becomes really is, is really expensive it balances with the cost of alternative energies those alternative energies can then take off and growth right. is not a bad thing and using energy is not a bad thing it's just we want to do it more cleanly we want to do it more efficiently can we um you know find a way to get off the oil which you know is not necessarily going to last forever whereas we have the sun that's probably going to last for you know yeah. several billion more years you know yeah. so can we can we and, do and that to, instead and just a quick thing on the oil too every decade we use as much oil as has ever been used before in the history of mankind so like 1970 used as much oil as it ever been used in the history of mankind in 1980 yeah. we used everything and we did in the 1970s and everything that we'd ever used in history. We did it again in the 90s, we doubled it. Mm -hmm. the, the yachts, we doubled it. And we're scheduled to double it again. And one of the things I think that, I, a common misnomer I, I hear a lot is that the energy companies aren't gonna wanna go out of business once we reach a point where we can't physically extract any more oil out of the ground. And that they're gonna switch up and delve heavily into uh, alternative energies. And the misnomer there is that oil companies are energy companies. They absolutely are not. They have nothing right. to do with energy whatsoever. They're, right. a, they're a mining operation that pulls oil out of the ground, have a trillions of dollars of invested uh, uh, technologies right. and machineries into pulling this product, mining it from the, from the earth and delivering it. They, they really don't have any, <laughs> any hand in or any aspect of interest in actually providing energy through alternative means. It's not their business. They're simply their oil business. extraction companies. Yeah. yeah. Well, we need to go to our break. This is This Week in Science. If you want to Me? respond oh. to Justin's, not you, the listeners, <laughs> anyone who's listening right now, if you want to respond to Justin's comments, this conversation that we're just having, having uh, send me an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Make sure to put twists in the subject line. I'd love to be able to read your responses next week or the week Maybe after. Maybe I'll send in a response because I think I could counter yeah. my argument pretty well. All right. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Let's go to the break. Let's take it to the break. Thanks for watching. <laughs> This is the break, and I'd like to thank Audible for sponsoring this hour of 
This Week in Science. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 different titles that you can choose from in a variety of different genres that, you know, some you know and love, others that maybe aren't your favorites, but, you know, there's always something for everybody in their library. And you can start a free trial today and, uh, you know, pick out the twists audio uh pick out a book that twist recommends which i don't have anything to recommend this week sorry or you can pick out any book that you'd like to download for free the twist book club we read books and you could listen along if the books that we have are in the audible library um which that's happened in the past this month not not so much but it has happened in the past and it will happen again to do this free trial thingy all you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist. That's audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist. You get a free audiobook download, which you can take with you anywhere on any device that you choose that takes those audiobook downloads. You can take it and uh, listen to it at your leisure. That's right. Just sign up right now. Go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist. Now for your free download. And we're back. This is This Week in Science, and um, I've got a story for you that's pretty cool. I really um, I really thought this story was an interesting one. Um, we've talked a bit in the past about how life possibly started in hot hydrothermal vents, how it could have started in mud. Um, you know, where did life, how did life get its start? Well, there's a story out um, this week. It was a, I believe it was a nature study um, that a researcher, um, let me see if I can find his name in here, um, Atwater, Atwater is the researcher's name. He has uh, come up with this idea that ice could have possibly been the, I guess, the proving ground for life, that it could have mm -hmm. provided the environment. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Could have provided the environment to allow life to evolve. Um, and it's really an interesting idea, however, slightly controversial and, you know, causing a bunch of conversation in scientific circles, which is always fun. Um, but the idea is based on RNA. And um, you know, normally you think of ice as, okay, it's really cold, Cold slows down biological processes. Um, you know, things maybe wouldn't happen. How could it? How could ice actually allow this to take place? So, Can I guess? yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things I would I would would first leaps into my mind is um, because it, it because it slows growth because it's sort of inhospitable. Life that does form won't be spread out very much. It won't be allowed to encounter very much other life form. So if it splits off and goes somewhere else, it's probably locked over there for a really, really long time. So in a way, a lack of competition um, will allow them to sort of find their own niches. That would be that would be my first guess. Cause especially because if you look at if you look at Arctic regions uh, where there is less prevalence of life. Most of life forms up there subsist without a whole lot of interaction with each other versus an area like the tropics where the jungle is alive and you can be eaten by, by something from above or below or within. I mean, it's everywhere. There's, there's right. competition everywhere but, but, in the jungle. Right, and but in the, the jungles, the fittest. right, but in the jungles, there's also a lot more biodiversity than there is in, in, in the Arctic regions. Or so, is there? Uh, uh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to count to you in just a minute. Go on, go ahead. 
<laughs> okay. So um, what this what this researcher James Atward, Atwater, he's from Cambridge University, what he is suggesting is that the properties of ice actually were just right to fuel certain replicator molecules. And so these replicator molecules are molecules that can make copies of themselves and then kind of evolve over time. And um, it didn't have to be DNA to do it in, at first. And he suggests that RNA was the right kind of molecule to start to create these replicator molecules in the in icy environments. So uh, explained by Ed Young on not exactly rocket science, not rocket science on his Discover magazine blog, um, he says that, um, uh, let's see, that there's an RNA in the form of, uh, that RNA in the form of ribozymes, they're um, enzymes for RNA molecules, can actually speed up its own creation without any proteins. And Atwater found a ribozyme called R18 that's active at temperatures below freezing or even below zero. And he found also that not only was it still active, this R18 ribozyme was stabilized by ice so it didn't break down so that it could actually keep working for longer and creating longer lengths of RNA with just as much accuracy. So the accuracy didn't decrease. It was actually better and it lasted longer. Um, the question of, you know, ice is solid. It's not water. He says that, um, that this, you know, this might prevent molecules from meeting each other with ease, but ice isn't completely solid. At a microscopic level, there's a network of channels and spaces that aren't completely frozen that uh, it's actually salty water, especially if you're in the oceans, there's going to be salt, uh, the salt crystals that are going to come together to keep the water uh, crystals a little bit apart. And so surrounding molecules would freeze and keep dissolved, keep the salty water in little pockets where the concentration of ions, nucleotides and other chemicals, says Young, and other chemicals in the liquid compartments would be concentrated by over 200 times, accelerating the work of the ribozymes and compensate, more than compensating for the slowing effects of the cold. So he, in the lab, he demonstrated that ice provides the right conditions for this cold RNA world to take off, but we don't have any evidence that it actually did. And so, um, it, whereas we have tons of evidence that life might have gotten started in hot on deep sea vents or around these, these smoker vent areas. There's another researcher, Bill Martin from the University of Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf, who, uh, who looked at Atwater's work on ice and the quote that is in this article Interesting experiments, I suppose, but holes in ice had as much to do with the origin of life as the electric toaster. <laughs> well, you know, I guess, <laughs> I guess the electric toaster may have played a much more crucial role in the development of life than any of us conceived. <laughs> Possibly. That's, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's the counter segue. This is, this is right mm -hmm. out of the appropriate story for the appropriate uh, moment uh, yeah little thing that just spits these out uh, I love across that. the globe <laughs> as, we, as we were just talking about diversity of plants and animal species uh sort of is more uh, frequent more dense around the equator around the tropical regions and the, the further north or south you go towards the poles the less diversity of life there seems to be but surprisingly that rule isn't true for Soil bacteria. Oh, interesting. According to a new study by Queen's University biology professor Paul Grogan, it appears the rules determining the pattern of uh, patterns for plant and animal diversity are different than the rules for bacteria. The finding is important because one of the goals of in ecology is to explain patterns and distribution of species and understand biological and environmental factors that determine why species occur when they do. So the researchers examined the composition and genetic difference of soil, soil bacterial communities from 29 remote Arctic locations 
across Canada, Alaska, Iceland, Greenland, and Sweden. Report, the report had a second surprising finding. The researchers expected the soil samples taken 20 meters apart would be more similar in terms of bacterial diversity than soil samples taken 5,500 kilometers apart because in theory, plant or animal communities from nearby locations are likely um, to be much more genetically similar than those from distant locations, either through migration or cross, you know, sharing of DNA sorts of things. But generally they found that each soil sample contained thousands of bacterial types, 50% uh, of which were unique to each sample. It also turned out that there was no similarity pattern in relation to distance at all. Even in comparing side-by-side -side samples, the samples taken from either side of the continent, uh, they realized that this, uh, this really amazed me, said Professor Grogan. So this is, this is, uh, this is sort of the, the Justin theory then. Because <laughs> there is, because there are spread out, because there's probably less, uh, it's a slower, a slower ecology, slower biological uh, system there there's not a lot of spread. So one colony that's very dominant doesn't get a chance to dominate all of its neighbors. In fact, in this case, it sounds like it really doesn't get to dominate anywhere except for its little patch. Um, so right. for biodiver so the, the, connecting it to the story that you just did, it actually makes a pretty good case, those two side by side, if, if the, the bacteria in the soils of, around the equator are much less diverse than those at the poles. Perhaps this is this explains why you know they they would have had a better footing somewhere else. It, it's actually a better experiment for life if it's allowed to have many 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 different uh, attempts at coming into being than uh, than less attempts. I mean that's just mathematically you know that simple. <laughs> More shots at it at the pole. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. That's. I think it's. In, I think it's an interesting idea. No matter what, it definitely deserves more attention. It needs to be studied. Yeah, and these findings have been yeah. accepted for publication in the journal Environmental Microbiology. So, anybody mm -hmm. interested in following up on that? This Dirt was, bugs. Uh, University of Queens, University, and the University of Colorado should both have some information on this for you as well. Awesome. Have you ever wondered how your brain communicates with itself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How does that happen? How does it talk to itself? What is going on in there? There's a uh, a saying in neuroscience that's uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. And this study, this story came out of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, it was sent to be sent in by monkey. And uh, it's really interesting that researchers, principal ex investigator Jose Carmena, he's an assistant professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences, the Program in Cognitive Sciences, and the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. He says evidence from this study supports the idea that neuronal oscillations are a critical mechanism for organizing the activity of individual neurons into larger functional groups. So... They looked at action potentials, or what are called spikes, spiking um, behavior of neurons uh, across the brain in multiple different regions. And they compared that spiking activity to um, synchronized brain rhythms. And so we talk about different um, frequency bands. There's like the theta rhythm, the alpha rhythm, and all these kinds of things. They found... In one, in one case, that, um, that the high beta band, which is in the 25 to 40 hertz or cycles per second range, was really important for brain areas involved in motor control and planning. And so the timing of when individual neurons decided to fire their action potentials was actually synchronized with that high beta band if they were involved in these motor control and planning regions. If they weren't, if they're, you know, involved in vision or some other aspect of, of cognition or, or behavior, they were linked to a different oscillatory band. 
The, another researcher on the study, Ryan Canolti, says if neurons only cared about what was happening in their local environment, then it would be difficult to get neurons to work together if they happened to be in different cortical areas. But when multiple neurons spread all over the brain are tuned to a specific pattern of electrical activity at a specific frequency, then whenever that global activity pattern occurs, those neurons can act as a coordinated assembly. And so basically neurons are phase coupling to these oscillations within the brain. So there are these uh, oscillation patterns that, that occur and certain, certain neurons wire and fire according to those oscillations. It's pretty interesting. Wild. Yeah, yeah. The, the researchers suggest that uh, this could be used to improve performance of brain machine interfaces or to lead to novel strategies for regulating dysfunctional brain networks through electrical stimulation. So there could be potential treatments and um, uses for this understanding as we get, as we learn a little bit more about it. Brains! Oh, and also sent in by Monkey, I think was who sent it in, uh, the Homer Simpson gene. Have you heard about that one? Mm -mm. No. So researchers at Emory University deleted a gene in mice called RGS14. And um, without it, the mice got smarter. They learned maze. <laughs> they remembered objects and they navigated mazes more quickly than not tampered with mice. So they call it the Homer Simpson gene. <laughs> That's awesome. A gene we developed to keep us from... From knowing and remembering possibly yeah they don't the, so the question is like what you know what purpose does this gene actually uh actually have me? yeah that, i would i would not i would not want that gene removed there's no <laughs> way no you remember you, we've talked about this i think we just I want to learn new things i want to have better no, memory it's not about yeah. learning new things it's not, it's about not forgetting anything even the most <laughs> trivial piece of information that you just didn't need to know I could tell you what the weather was yesterday and the day before and the day before that and the day I can tell you every stock number of every automobile in the dealership's lot. Or I can I can tell you every check number and where it went. To. There's stuff we're supposed to forget. There's stuff we're supposed to get kicked out of there so that we can get new stuff and we can have hopefully mostly the stuff that we like in our brain. And the way we get stuff we like in our brain is surrounding ourselves with those things that we like. So they're and we're accessing them more often, they're remembered better. If we can't forget stuff, we remember every lousy thing, every trivial, inconsequential but this, thing. This, this doesn't brains. necessarily have anything to do with not forgetting. So that's the that's the thing. It's just involved in, it's, it's located in an area of the hippocampus called CA2. That, um, and the hippocampus is an area of the brain that's involved in learning and new memory formation. And the CA2 isn't really well understood. This region, we don't really know, but it's not necessarily involved in forgetting. Forgetting is usually a part, a different part of the brain. This is, the hippocampus is involved in new memory formation. So, you know, forgetting so is, is a different it's process creating, altogether. It's creating new memories that like become that part of your hard drive that you can't defrag. That won't I move. don't know. You're ju you're jumping at conclusions I here. That's you're completely... my job is to jump into speculation. <laughs> that's my, that's the whole thing I'm doing here. Yeah, that, because why else? Would, what else would contribute to these mice having better memory, right? Or better? I mean, what is it? What else is there but locking in the memory of a task that that this can be attributed to? It's not in a part of the brain that's in charge of forgetting, but perhaps it does create a don't overwrite feature of the brain. Maybe that's all forgetting that's is. Maybe maybe how you learn something is de that's designed to, to you know. That's that's uh, an interesting that's an interesting point. That, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. Give me another story, dude. Okay, this is a uh, double-sided story of new research that has found a genetic variant which reduces the chances of contracting diseases such as tuberculosis and leprosy is more prevalent in populations with long histories of urban living. So it's a little bit about the uh, evolution of modern man. And it says, yeah, basically it's those the, those of us who are from uh, cultures or societies that have been urbanized with large populations over a longer period of time throughout history have many more resistances to diseases. It's basically all this story is. Um, 
and that population density seems to play an important role in shaping so many aspects of species. It was a vital factor in our species maintaining the complex skills and culture that distinguish us from other primates. It drove many genetic differences we see today between different populations around the world, and now it seems it also has influenced infectious disease spread in the past and how we evolved to resist those diseases. What's not said here is that perhaps it's not that we've evolved to resist these diseases. It's perhaps not true that we have evolved uh, these resistances, but that these resistances were there in some of the population, and that by being part of an urban population, your chances of dying of any given disease are much higher than if you're not around all those disease-ridden humans, and that it's just those of us who happen to have the, the DNA that was resistant already have survived through natural selection of urbanized areas. Because I think we've had a, I think there's been a few large waves of plague that have, that have uh, affected large urban centers that, you know, if you were rural enough, that might not hit you. Yeah, you might not be resistant to it, but you also might not have been here if you were an ans if one of your ancestors was living in one of those urban areas. So it's kind of a funny right. way to look at it, sort of assuming that it's uh, a built-up resistance to immunity and not just a complete natural selection where anybody who wasn't immune died. <laughs> All their ancestors died, so they never had a shot at being on the planet. <laughs> That's funny. I just want to jump into these two stories really fast ed dyer said in a story about neanderthals more information has surfaced by uh, anthropologist julian riel salvatore who has been studying uh, he's from university of colorado denver he has been studying neanderthals and he says hey Neanderthals were far more resourceful than we've given them credit for. He published a study in in uh, Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory. It's coming out in December, so we're uh, we're ahead of the publication here. It's probably online though. He studied Neanderthal sites throughout Italy and seven sites. Yeah, seven years of studying sites throughout Italy, and he he pretty much says based on different tools that they created, different things that were within the archaeological sites that he studied, um, that the Ulusian is a Neanderthal culture, and it suggests that contacts with modern humans are not necessary to explain the origin of their new behaviors. It stands in contrast to the ideas of the past 50 years that Neanderthals had to be acculturated to humans to come up with this technology. When we show Neanderthals could innovate on their own, it casts them in a new light humanizes them if you will and he's one of the researchers who's of the opinion that uh, Neanderthals were exterminated that were not exterminated by modern humans and that they probably just became absorbed by the larger more easily reproducing human population uh, growing homo sapien population additionally um, in in the light of uh, of of being a hardy species Study out in. Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. We just we just passed over this real quick. No, I know because we are done with the show. For like a dec, or for you know, for a lot, for as long as we've been doing this show, I was postulating that Neanderthal had uh, cross mingled with with modern man, right. and likely much of the much of their disappearance may have actually been through breeding. That they you know started mating with us. That maybe they found us more interesting than the average Neanderthal. And started right. dating, you know, the humans. And they found evidence of this. Actually, just about anybody with a European, Middle Eastern, or Western uh, bloodline has Neanderthal in their genes. There's a lot of Western culture that has Neanderthal genes in them. They haven't found any samples of Neanderthal uh, that actually had human genes in it, which is interesting. Um, but it may be we were there in greater numbers. Maybe we could hunt better. Maybe we were just more efficient. So we became better choices for, for mating than uh, any of their, uh, their, the Neanderthals that were, were in existence. We may have integrated them out of existence, yeah. uh, so to speak. It's very, very possible. 
It's very possible that we were very sim that they were very similar to us. Uh, this researcher he actually thinks that they were a subspecies of human and not actually a separate species, which could be a little bit controversial and very interesting. That's kind of controversial, but they had language. They had you know ceremonial mm -hmm. burials. They had jewelry. They they were you know they, they, they were, were complex. They were pretty advanced, short yeah. little, strong people. <laughs> right. Okay. Strong species survive. How do they survive? They survive radio radioactivity from nuclear disasters like Chernobyl. There's a study appearing in the Environmental Science and Technology Journal. Researchers looking at plants to see how they could have possibly fared so well after the Chernobyl uh disaster in 1986. The researchers looked at uh, seeds from soybeans and flax plants that were grown near the site of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. And they found that these plants actually have mechanisms uh, within them that allow them to thrive in the highly radioactive environments. What are these possible mechanisms? How does it possibly work? Well, in soybeans, they detected the mobilization of seed storage proteins and processes similar to see what we see when plants adapt to high levels of heavy metals. So they were the so the plants could have possibly been compartmentalizing um, the the uh, the radioactive particles that were that they were being affected by. Um, and in flax, what they ended up seeing were more proteins involved in cell signaling. And they, they just say that it's, it's unbelievable how quickly this, this ecosystem has been able to adapt. There must be some kind of mechanism that plants already have inside of them. Radioactivity has always been present here on Earth from the very early stages of our planet's formation. There was a lot more radioactivity on the surface back then than there is now we have a thicker atmosphere um, that blocks radiation from coming down to the earth. So probably when life was evolving, these plants came across radioactivity and they probably developed some mechanisms that they still have with them. Kind of cool. So, awesome. um, you know, humans, we didn't evolve long ago enough to maybe have those have those mechanisms inherently in ourselves so yeah we're not going to make it very far but the plants will survive the plants will survive um on next week's show we're done with the show on next week's show we'll be back with more science i'd like to thank everyone who wrote in with stories ed dyer those stories were great gord mcleod monkey um david eckard and lars ruhlman Thank you so much for the stories you sent in. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you everybody for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twists is also available as a podcast. Just search for us in the This Week in Science iTunes uh, directory there. If you have an uh, Android service, you can get us on the Android. We are Twist for Droid app at the uh, Android Marketplace. Are we on the iTunes phone yet? <laughs> yeah, I, no. Yeah. <laughs> we're still no, not nope. on that. No, not, there's not a bazillion on, applications on there. We're still not there. We're not there yet. Sorry. Wow. But for more information on anything that you've heard today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. It's twist.org. And we also want to hear from you. So email me at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Or uh, Justin at this... Oh, wait, never mind. Oh, go to at Jacksonfly and send me a message on the uh, Twitter sphere. Because I, I can hear you there. But uh, right. you can also... Yeah, you can contact uh, Dr. Kiki there, too. At Dr. Kiki. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. We will be back here next week, same time, same place. And we hope that you will join us again for more great science news. And if you have learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know.
Bam, 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 bam.